Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me today. So we should have some excitement on this uh, Stitch With Me session because I'm about to hit my first zero on this pattern. Yeah, so that'll be exciting. It's um, this stitch right here. I have one left, as you can see, if you look in the upper right corner of the, that screen. Um, yeah, I have one stitch left of that color, so, but course as always I try to not close in stitches so I'm gonna have to work my way over to it but we should definitely get to that during this session so yay yeah a little sense of accomplishment there since when I stitch with pattern keeper I turn off the uh, page breaks so I no longer get the uh, the accomplishment of finishing a page like I used to. So I have to find other ways to uh, give myself those little uh, dopamine hits, right? <laughs> yeah, so there's a, uh, when I move the, the frame, I take a picture, and update my uh, Instagram, so that's one of them. There's every time I get to the bottom of a diagonal, I have a little bit of a, I accomplished something feeling especially when uh, I always um, export my progress when I get to the bottom of a diagonal which is about every one to two days depending on how much time I've had to stitch so yeah there's that and then there's um, of course when I get to big milestone numbers like 20,000 100,000 and then, of course, there is getting a zero, which is what we are going to get today, so. Yeah, it took me over 54% of this pattern before I reached my first zero. <laughs> Yeah, I started this almost a year ago, so it's been a while. Reaching the halfway point is another nice big one. Although sometimes it almost feels like the uh, the second half of a project can almost seem to take longer than the first. That's usually not the case, but it feels like it. Almost unthreading my needle there. Don't want to do that. Especially, I'm just about to end it off. But, uh, one of the hazards of working with shorter pieces is to be careful not to unthread them. Okay, wow, lots of single stitches here, yeah. Tree branches are quite, quite intricate. Lots of detail. Yeah, and I 
wasn't able to stitch as much the last few days because we've been busy uh, putting in the new bathtub to replace the one my, uh, my son broke. <laughs> yeah, he's getting out of the tub and he, his knee leaned on the side and it was so old it, that it put a hole in it, cracked it open. So, but yeah, we discovered the tub was uh, original to the house, which was uh, built in 74. So I think it served us well, <laughs> quite a while. to my husband well the bathtub is older than you then <laughs> but uh, oh they must have um they must have put it in first and sort of built the rest of the room around it because uh oh getting it getting the old one out and the new one in there that was uh oh boy that was quite the process the tub itself wasn't too bad but the enclosure bit that goes around the back because it's a combination tub shower. That piece, because it's curved and it's in one piece, trying to get it sort of around the uh, the walls and stuff. Oh, that was that was a nightmare. We had to take the door of the bathroom off. And then even then it wasn't quite, so my husband had to pull some of the, um, like the trim that went around the door. We had to pull that off and we had to kind of walk it around, spin it around in the living room, spin it around to get it into the hallway, go into our bedroom, spin it around again to get it facing the right way so that we could get it into the bathroom. Oh, so I said, you know, I can understand why a lot of people are going just for the, you know, the square glass shower enclosures and not bothering with a tub because my gosh, that is a big pain. Yeah, I honestly myself wouldn't really mind not having a bathtub, but my uh, my husband and son prefer baths, so I like showers better. I feel cleaner, and um, well, I'm one of those people who likes their uh, <laughs> who likes their uh, wash water boiling hot, which I know is not the healthiest thing, but I can't help it. I've always liked it that way. It's like, I have dry skin. I really know that I shouldn't be, <coughs> excuse me, using such hot water, but I try to promise myself that I won't turn it that hot, but I end up doing it anyway. <laughs> uh, although I do rinse my hair with uh, colder water, to sort of help seal the, uh, the hair shaft. Cause so I, at the beginning of my shower, I fill up a a big pitcher that I keep just for that purpose. That way I can just um, bend over my tub and uh, pour it over my head and not have to have cold water going down the rest of me because that's not fun. But yeah, so I said the next time that tub needs replacing, which hopefully isn't for quite a while, we're probably gonna have to pay somebody to do it because uh, my husband said, I'm getting too old for this stuff, you know, mid forties. You don't bounce back the way you did when you were 20. So, but yeah, I'm really lucky. He's very handy and fix, fixes almost anything. We often say if he can't fix something, it is probably not fixable. So yeah, he uh, took after his dad in that. It's definitely saved us a lot of trouble. lot of money anyway maybe not trouble but uh, definitely saved us a lot of cash so yeah he put in uh, our furnace when it needed replacing and the water heater now the bathtub he also redid our wiring because um it was like the one year this house was built was the one year they experimented and used aluminum wiring and it's not good. It, um, especially with the extreme temperatures we have, it gets, uh, it contracts and that can get very brittle and break and then arc and then, yeah, cause a fire. So he's an electrical guy. So he replaced that all with proper copper wiring because uh, yeah, it was a disaster waiting to happen. We actually had a really bad outlet that um, it killed three microwaves before I realized it wasn't 
I wasn't buying dud microwaves. It was the, uh, it was the outlet it was arcing and stuff. And so he went to check it out and he said when he screwed off the cover, it was practically melted inside. So yikes. Yeah, that was, that was not good. We were very fortunate that there wasn't any fires. Because, yeah, unfortunately, bad wiring is one of the leading causes, right? There's actually a couple houses on our street who also had aluminum wiring that uh, fell victim to that. Unfortunately, we had one a few houses down, and it actually caught in the attic um, Christmas Eve one year and of course the people were away um, visiting family so there was nobody to hear the uh, smoke alarms go off and by the f time one of the neighbors noticed that you know the attic was on fire <laughs> they um we had um the streets were absolutely sheer ice because we'd had like freezing rain and they don't plow our streets here very much definitely not as much as is necessary oh that one's loose and uh, so, yeah, the fire trucks had a really hard time getting here. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't race out here. They had to take it slow so they didn't crash the darn things. So, unfortunately, by the time they got here, that their upper level was a complete loss. I felt so bad for them. Like, yes, good thing nobody was hurt, but yeah, it was not good. And it was another one that they had it, but fortunately, the family caught it very quickly while well, it was still just in the smoldering stage and so they were able to put it out very quickly with very little very little uh fuss but uh yeah so my husband said yeah that's it i am changing the wiring now yeah and i'm saying with getting this tub in too i was really glad we have uh we still have yet to uh, fix our walls after he did the wiring because, of course, he had to cut holes in it to fish things through. And uh, so I said, I guess it turns out good that we hadn't had a chance to uh, to get that done yet because now we would have scratched up the, uh, the paint and such getting that uh, tub enclosure. And, yeah, the old one wasn't, you know, we could have broken it or cut it up and taken it out, but the problem was the new one was just about the same size and... So we used taking the old one out as sort of a dry run. If we broke it, well, wouldn't be the end of the world, right? Uh, and then fortunately, the new one turned out to be actually an inch smaller, and that made a big diff, all the difference in uh, being able to maneuver it. So, uh. yeah, I've often said. If I went back in time, I could give up a lot of things, you know, electricity, even the internet, but um, indoor plumbing, that would be really tough, especially having hot water, you know, on tap whenever you want it. We are really spoiled with that, right? Yeah. Well, because one time we had, when we had to replace the water heater and uh, the part we needed was on back order. So we had to wait like a week for it to come in. And uh, so we ended up having to do it the old fashioned way and uh, heat up big, uh, big pots of water on the stove to bathe. And I thought, okay, now, you know, I understand why uh, in the older times people took a bath like once a week because boy, that's such a pain when you have to do it that way. Oh. It is a lot of work. I could see why people would just say, you know, Forget about it. I'm not that dirty. <laughs> yeah, and right now this house only has one and a half baths. We're putting a second shower downstairs but we just haven't again haven't had time to get around to it so yeah it's the one bath slash shower that's uh for all of us so my husband said well this is the incentive now for him to to get that done yeah 
Yeah, we had friends actually saying, you know, if you need to come over and use our shower, it's okay. So, well, thank you very much. But luckily, yeah, we were able to uh, get the tub in quick enough that uh, we didn't have a problem. little fluffy end there just did not want to go back to the other side but yeah that's one thing with home ownership I swear these uh these things just never seem to end, right? That's the one, the one drawback is you are responsible for all that maintenance and repair. So yeah, I like owning and I know I'm very, very lucky to be able to own my house, but uh, yeah, there is a price to it. I know it's not for everybody. I have a few friends who say they have no interest in owning because of that. They don't want to have to deal with, you know, property taxes and having to take care of all the, all the repairs and maintenance yourself. I can understand that. Okay, let's see how long this one is, if I can carry it back up or not. Try to catch only those threads. No, this is a short one, so it's only going to be enough for where I parked it. Yeah, I will have to start a new shorter thread for those other ones, those other three in this section. Threads have to run out sometime, right? Okay. So, only 45 left of this color. We're getting closer to that one being done as well. Yeah, I kind of like the ones where people stitch all of one color. It, uh, looks pretty neat. They don't have to switch colors, so that's, but then you do have to count very carefully. That would be my worry is, uh, I miscount enough even sometimes in, uh, oh, what have I done here? Let me double check. Oh, look at that. Okay, that goes there, that goes there. This one doesn't go there. Yeah, that one I parked incorrectly. I can see what I did now. Okay. Oh, still recovering from the time change, so I'm going to blame it on that. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I promise I won't break out in song. <laughs> that was a... That was a uh, popular country song in the 90s by, who was it now? Was it Colin Ray or John Michael Montgomery? I can't remember now. And yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I ain't got a witness and I can't prove it, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I was really into country music when I was a younger teen. Not so much now, although there are still some, still some songs I really like. I'm actually more into um, the stuff that's not very mainstream. Um, my favorite band is Apocalyptica, who does um, heavy metal music on um, on cellos. Yeah, I think they're one of the most underrated bands ever. Most of their stuff is without lyrics. And uh, it's re it's really, really good. I really love it. They started by covering songs by Metallica. 
and uh, now they write their own original pieces. Yeah, they sound really amazing. Even live, because I have a couple of recordings that are of them live, and you can hardly even tell that they're live, except for, of course, it has the uh, the audience noise in it. But they're, yeah, they're really tight. You know they're really talented when they can still perform with the same or similar quality live as in a studio when you don't get retakes when it's live, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah, I actually discovered Apocalyptica because of one of my other passions, which if you've watched other videos you know about, which is figure skating. And um, one of the French figure skaters, Brian Joubert, he liked to skate to a lot of Apocalyptica stuff. And uh, I thought, wow, that sounds really nice. My ears just perked up. So, uh, yeah, I checked it out. Yeah, so I like his stuff. I like um, David Garrett, who uh, he's a classically trained violinist, but now he does rock covers on uh, on the violin with a um, orca orchestra backup. Yeah, his stuff is really awesome. Again, most it's without lyrics. And uh, he does one of uh, Walk This Way that just rocks. I actually like it better than the original. So... Gosh, I cannot seem to grab it there. There we go. It's kind of close to the edge and the rolled up fabric was in my way. So, ta-da, our first zero, woohoo! That's fun. <laughs> so yeah, often when I get to that zero, when I zeroed out a color, I just take the, um, the envelope that I stored it in out and I just pull it and put it back in my master set. And then there's uh, fewer of them to dig through while I'm looking for, uh, for colors. So that's fun. Yeah, thanks to Pattern Keeper, it's much easier to tell when you are actually done a color. So I'll often set them aside sort of in an, its own box for a while. And when I'm sure that I actually did get all the colors, I didn't miss one. Because, of course, that happens sometimes. You know, you mark one as done when you meant to mark it parked or just by accident. Because, of course, sometimes you go to hit the check mark and you accidentally highlight another stitch that's close to the check mark without realizing it. I've done that a few times. So I keep it nearby for a little while to make sure that I didn't, you know, usually after I've done another diagonal to make sure that I didn't do that. And then I put it back in my master set. And yeah, then it's done. So that's fun. Yeah, so you guys were here when I hit 50%. Now you're here when I hit my first zero. Make sure I'm parking this correctly. There are a lot of threads parked, so kind of check next to the grid lines as well. Not just by previously parked threads, because I might have made a mistake with one of those. I've done that before. And it throws everything else off. And then you gotta try to fix it. Pulled the wrong side there to line that up for a loop start. Okay.
think I'm just, I'll actually leave that threaded for now. Sometimes I unthread it if I know I'm not going to be getting back to a, to a thread for a while. So, yeah, another separate thread. I've got some short pieces because these are all kind of scattered about. Don't want to carry too much across the back. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Just got it lined up and then I messed it up. Wondering where that bright red little tiny bit of lint came from. I guess one of these stitches. <laughs> See, I haven't stitched with much red in a while. Yeah, that's so short. I'm going to unthread it because I don't think it will stay. On the needle. Okay, a whole bunch of these. Okay, just checking the other ones. Okay, that's long enough. Okay, so this one I'm going to end off. Yeah, so the length of the thread that I have parked and also the length of any other threads of the same color that I have parked nearby will uh, help me determine what I'm gonna do with each thread. Mm, that pin stitch was a little longer than I usually make, but oh well. Yeah, I try to make them sort of a little shorter so they really disappear, but it'll get stitched over and all the colors in that little area are fairly dark, so it will cover it up without a problem. Okay, so again, I'm going to check. That's a long piece. Okay, so that's fine. This is, ah, this one is so short, I can't really carry it anywhere anyway. So, no prob. Try to get my needle to go through the correct spot. Yeah, so when I first started using pin stitches, I was a little nervous they wouldn't be um, secure as drawing it through other stitches across the back, but uh, I actually find they're more secure. Removing them is a real struggle, so... Uh, and then, of course, stitching over them will make them even more secure. So I don't worry about that anymore. Yeah, because I did a bunch wrong once and had to remove them, and my gosh... They basically just shred it apart. <clears throat> mm. I had to cut them very, very short to be able to pull them free. That was before I stitched with parking. So yeah, I did a whole bunch. I grabbed the wrong uh the wrong color. Oh my gosh, look at that. I did it again. Yeah, this number 4 is parked one row too high. Oh. Darn you time change. You're messing with my my stitching. Yeah. So when I'm tired, I make I make dumb mistakes. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. some people, uh, they bounce back pretty quick, but it takes me at least four to six weeks to, to adjust. I always feel like um, I've just gotten used to it, and then it's time to mess with the darn clocks again. Ugh. <clears throat> I'm 
Okay, so another one I may travel the thread up if it is long enough. It is. Okay, which means going over to the left to fill in that stuff and working my way back. Because I like to keep from closing stuff in. going to be quite a few threads in this area of this color I'm sure yeah look at that my gosh quite tangled up there we are okay just looking at my pattern for a minute there trying to figure out what path I will take with different threads to be the most efficient while still keeping from closing stuff in. So I'm gonna park that there, <coughs> pardon me, and then I'm gonna use a different thread to do these ones and carry on down towards the left. Yeah. So after a while, it becomes second nature to plan your paths and there's also just a fair amount of playing it by ear involved. Because, of course, unexpected stuff happens, like your thread gets a knot in it that can't be removed and you've got to cut it out. So now you ended up not being able to do as many stitches as you planned with it. And you have to readjust accordingly. So things like that. But that's okay. Like I said, no rules. This is supposed to be fun. Kind of like um mentioned I play piano and sometimes I don't always play the music exactly as written. I put my own flair on it. <laughs> I know um somebody actually shared a meme with me that said, you know, sheet music is just a uh, a sound recipe. I thought, well, they're not wrong. <laughs> and hey, what do we do with recipes? Right? I rarely follow one exactly. I do it my way. I know I have some, and I, um, I have one of those meal subscription boxes. And uh, they like to have everything baked in the oven at 450 degrees. That's just, uh, that's really hot. And uh, it's too easy to burn stuff at that temperature. Plus the fact that I have these um, reusable silicone mats that you can use in place of foil or parchment paper. And um, they can only go up to... 437 degrees so I can't use them if it's 450 they will burn so I often will adjust and lower the temp the called for temperature down to 425 and then add a bit more a few more minutes of cooking time and uh yeah I just I found I enjoyed it better that way because the first time I followed the pattern or I should say recipe not pattern and um I made uh, pizza calzones, which are kind of like like big pizza pockets. And uh, I put it for the minimum time at the temperature they said, and it came this close to burning. So it was a good thing I was right in the kitchen to take them out right when the timer went off or they would have burned. So after that, I said, you know what? I'm gonna do it my way. They can go for two to three more minutes at a slightly lower temperature and be just fine. I would rather have to cook something a little longer than burn it. You can't undo it, right? Yeah. So yeah, I resisted the meal kits for quite a while, but they are really helpful, especially if you're like me with, uh, I got, I suspect ADHD and it makes planning ahead really tough. 
and I uh, just don't have the mental energy to do it anymore. And so it's really nice to only have to make plans for half your meals a week, and then you cook whatever's in the box for the other, you know, three, four nights. And uh, I didn't think it would make that much of a difference, but it really does. It's really taken the pressure off because uh, I know there's a couple times I skipped a box for whatever reason, like it was Christmas time. And of course we were gonna have tons of leftover from the big Christmas dinner. So there was no point having more food delivered to the house, you know, you wanna be able to eat it in time. And, uh, oh my gosh, I was really hurting. <laughs> Once the leftovers ran out and I still had, you know, a few days to go before the next box. And, uh, yeah, I really realized how much I really relied on it. But it's always been for me, the actual cooking isn't that big of a deal. Even the cleanup I can handle. It's not fun, but I can do it. But the planning... It's the mental load, you know, of having to figure out what you're going to eat and make sure you buy all the stuff, but you have to make sure you don't buy too much produce because, you know, it'll go bad before you can use it. And, uh, yeah, just all sorts of stuff. And it's just, I did it when I was younger, but I don't have the mental energy. I mean, the world's been wild for the last few years, right? That takes a lot of mental energy, so... <laughs> Uh, I'm just getting older, right? Don't have as much left. I can understand why some people have the same meals every week, you know, like, oh, tonight's taco night or whatever. But then at the same time, that would bore me to eat the same thing over and over every week. I do like some variety. So that's another nice way the meal kits come in. I've tried all sorts of new foods I never would have tried before because of them. Discovered some stuff I like or I even ended up retrying things that I'd had as a kid and didn't really like as much and discovered actually I like them now. I wasn't a fan of couscous when I was a kid but uh, I quite enjoy it now. I ended up actually buying a big bag of it because uh, I mean it's so easy to make so it's really good on nights that you don't you don't really have anything planned and you need something quickly. I mean, it takes five minutes for it to rehydrate, right? And uh, goes as a good dish with just about anything. And, uh, yeah. My son likes it too. He's quite a picky eater. So that's, of course, very helpful. If it's something that we will all eat, even better. And yeah, I didn't think he would like it, but... Uh, Always offer to let him try. Oh, did I? No, that is. Okay. I got mixed up because number nine symbol was a completely different color on a different pattern I used. So I was looking at that and thinking, oh, but it's not pink. But then I remembered, right, number nine is not pink on this pattern. It is tan. So good. I thought for a minute I had really messed up, but I did not. Yeah, the, uh, the number six symbol is the pink on this one, so that's really messed up my head. I'm not dyslexic or anything, but I do tend to mix that up sometimes when I'm tired, which is, you know, most of the time. <laughs> yeah, I used to be so good at meal planning. We lived um, for a while in a small little town of like 300 people, so of course there was basically nothing there. We had a tiny little... Uh, well, we called it the Quickie Mart, right? But, I mean, the food was extremely expensive there. I went to buy a little bag of cherries once, and it was like one pound, and they wanted like eight bucks for it. Like, forget it. I'm not that rich. And um, so the closest grocery store was like 45-minute drive away. So, you know, you can't just pop out to the store to quickly buy something. I mean, you could, but that's way too much time and money and gas, right? So... I used to, uh, I was able to actually keep it down to uh, going to the grocery store every three weeks. At that time, it was just my husband and myself, so only two of us to feed. And fortunately, we had a deep freeze, which helps a lot. 
And uh, yeah, I would sit down and write a three week meal plan. Of course, also having to make sure you use up all the stuff with the fresh produce first. And then the last couple weeks, you know, you're making say like spaghetti and stuff because you're using, you know, canned tomatoes and canned mushrooms and such. You don't have to worry about eating those on time before they go bad. No, well, not as much. I mean, they will go bad eventually, but. And so, yeah, I was, I was really good at it. I was so diligent with it. And then, then we moved into bigger city, which is population, you know, 30,000 people and, uh, started slacking off. <laughs> Now I just, yeah, I can't get back into that habit again. Yeah, I'd like to maybe blame it on baby brain, but my baby's almost 15, so I don't think I can, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> oh, dear. But yeah, sometimes my kid will try what's in the meal kit. A lot of times he just, he eats his own thing. Nice thing is too, he's big enough now that he can do it himself, you know? So like making hard boiled eggs, he doesn't want them, he wants scrambled. Well, you know where the eggs are, you know where the pan is, you can handle that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't mind this age at all. And they got a little more independence. They don't need you quite so much all the time. Yeah, I think that's the exhausting part when they're little. It's, they just, they need you for so much all the time, right? Yeah, not that I didn't enjoy when he was little. I did. But I don't mind this stage either. Oh, I can see. Already see that I may have... No. Nope. Oh, I have two browns in this area. That's why. Ah. I thought for a moment I had parked one incorrectly, but no. That's because there's two shades of brown very close to each other. So I actually did park them correctly. So yeah, always double check before you go to correct stuff. Because sometimes it may actually have been correct and you were mixed up. And then you've just made it incorrect. Don't want that. Okay. So now we can finally do this stitch because I have filled everything else to the left of it. And this is one that I'm going to be... I've only got... After I do this, I'll only have 18 stitches of this left. But, of course, that depends as to whether all these 18 stitches are in this general vicinity or... There might be some at different spots of the pattern, so yeah, we'll see if I can actually uh, be able to zero it out soon or not. Okay, so three, three, four, six. So mark those as done. I'm just going to zoom out for a bit and see. Yeah, I can see there's uh, quite a few sort of scattered yeah all over the pattern so it's going to be a while before i can zero those out i can see these ones down here are below the 240 line so that'll be the next pass so that'll actually be probably a couple of months at least before i get to that again so yeah we'll have to be content with the one zero we got today Yeah, the most fun part is when you get to the end, you get to start zeroing out lots of them. I remember one day I, right near the end, I got to zero out about 15 colors in one day, so that was fun. I actually texted my friend about it. Yeah. <clears throat> 
yeah, it really kept me motivated because I took a picture that morning when I had about three, four hundred stitches left and uh, posted it on my uh, my Facebook and said, so do you guys think I can get it done today? And they're all like, oh yes, please, please, because uh, a lot of them had been there since uh, the beginning of the project, so a lot of them were very emotionally invested in it. So that was so much fun. And I was able to get it done that day. That was so exciting. Yeah, I truly believe humans were meant to create stuff. You know, if you look at most of our hobbies, it's almost always about making things or fixing things. It's hard to feel quite so nihilistic when you're you're creating something beautiful. Of course, there's also achieving things like people who like to, you know, run triathlons or whatever. Yeah. It's, uh... There's something about making something with your own hands, right? Like, I mean, we can get sweaters and blankets and things. We can buy them made by machines for so much cheaper than we can make them themselves, but them ourselves. But uh, there is something about something you made yourself or a gift of something that someone made for you with their own two hands. I remember keeping sweaters that my grandma made for me for years, even after they they no longer fit because, I mean, they were made just for me. <laughs> With love. Yeah, unfortunately, I had them stored in a box and uh, when I was a kid and we had them out in like a, a shed somewhere and we didn't have any deterrents like mothballs or anything and yeah. Some rats got in it and chewed it up for nesting, so I was so heartbroken. And I had some uh, some old dance outfits that my mom had made when I was a kid in there too. Yeah, I was pretty devastated. I mean, of course, there's no way I could wear any of them again, but that wasn't why I was keeping them. Okay, so... That one, I could see what path I'm gonna do. I think I'll start another short piece for a couple of these other ones. Yeah. Well, you know. Sentimental value is still value, right? Yeah. Often worth more to us than actual monetary value. I think. If you ask people what their most, you know, treasured possession is, it's usually not something expensive like their big screen TV or their computer. It's, you know, something like their grandmother's ring or, you know, something one of their parents gave to them or something that you really couldn't sell for any money but it's priceless to them right because of the, the memories and the love behind it oh my okay you know i thought i was gonna be too tired to chat with you much today but uh i guess i haven't really shut up the whole time <laughs> I'm really actually quite appreciative that you guys like when I talk. It's, uh, it's really sweet of you. I talk to myself all the time, so yeah, if you, uh, if you like listening to it, then I'm glad. Okay, so yeah, this one was what I decided earlier. I'm just going to do these two. 
that way I can do the other others of those while still while still keeping from closing stuff in. I didn't have to go out of order to do them. Because, yeah, I can see mostly. I can do the stitches to the left and above of those as I get to them. And then I don't have to close them in. All right. Get to do a bunch of ones here. will be just enough to do one more that's perfect all right so I'm gonna wrap this up for now because uh I gotta make some food so I was talking about food before <laughs> gotta make some food so uh thank you for joining me so much and I hope to see you here again all right thanks bye